preamps. But if you have it. What makes a preamp good or bad? And why are the good ones so expensive? Welcome to Lancaster Hi-Fi. I'm Stephen Lancaster. Let's talk about preamps. I'll define terms and scope the current discussion. I'll explore the various functions of a preamp, the best ways to implement those functions, and the differences between good and cheap. Along the way, I'll bring in some examples, but I'm going to draw most heavily from Morgan Jones's third edition of Valve Amplifiers, because that book, and specifically his in-depth discussion of preamp designs, has really opened my eyes to the differences between relatively cheap preamps, such as those included as parts of integrated amps and receivers, and preamps that employ the best design practices, which are costly to implement. Before I go further, what qualifies me to speak with any authority in any of my videos, including this one? I choose topics for research and production based on my current interests. My ability to do that research and encapsulate it in a coherent script draws on 40 years spent in science and engineering and 20 years of teaching at the university level. That said, my videos explore topics I'm learning about now. My ability to sift through the available information and make some sense of it draws heavily on 40 years of learning and internalizing the scientific method. As a scientist, I'm repeatedly tasked with birthing wonderful ideas about how the world works, and then trying to kill those ideas so that only the strongest survive. If you can believe what I say, it's not because of my many years of experience in hi-fi, but rather because I'm that guy who says, really? Prove it. Let's talk about preamps. The term preamp or preamplifier is broader than the common term implies. The term implies a stage of amplification preceding the main amplifier that drives your speakers. But in common use, the term has grown to include everything between the source, or several sources, including analog sources like turntables, tape decks, tuners, and CD players, or anything else with a DAC, and digital sources like streamers and CD transports. For example, I have this Soundavo HP DAC1 on my desktop. It's marketed as a digital-to-analog converter, that is, a DAC. But it also has buttons that allow me to choose among digital sources, whether sourced via USB or SPDIF inputs, and an analog line level source. It also has a volume control and a quarter-inch headphone jack. This preamp has analog outputs that I've connected via these RCA cables to the inputs on my desktop DGSE1 power amp, which in turn has outputs connected to my speakers via speaker cables. Does this unit do any amplification of the analog line level source? Maybe, but given that the input sensitivity of my power amp is half a volt RMS, and the maximum line level output of the HP DAC1 is 7.5 volts RMS, its main function downstream of its DAC is actually attenuation of the analog signal via the potentiometer behind the volume knob. That said, it's likely that the line level input signal passes through at least one buffer stage so that the output impedance, spec'd at 100 ohms, is independent of the volume setting. In practice, that buffer stage might look schematically something like this. Signal comes in here to the positive input of an op amp, and the op amp's output is fed back directly to the negative input. This circuit is known as a voltage follower because the voltage at the output reproduces or follows the input voltage exactly. The op amp's power supply rails, however, provide the power necessary to keep that voltage the same regardless of how current hungry, within reason, the next stage is. To show why this buffer stage is important, I need to add the volume control ahead of the input. The volume works by dividing the input between the op amp input and ground. With the pots tap all the way at the top, the op amp sees the full voltage of the signal. With the tap in the middle, the signal voltage is cut in half. And with the tap all the way at the bottom, 
the input of the op amp is grounded and gets 0% of the signal voltage. If I were to bypass the op amp and connect the volume pot's tap directly to the power amp input, the power amp would see a preamp output impedance of whatever the signal source has, plus the 100 ohm resistor with the tap at the top, or just 100 ohms with the tap at the bottom, and 50k and 50k in parallel, or 25k, plus source impedance and 100 ohms with the tap in the middle. With the buffer, the power amp always sees just the 100 ohm resistor, plus the negligible output impedance of the op amp, regardless of the volume setting. That's a great feature, especially if the input impedance of the power amp is, say, 10k or even 100k ohms. I'm sorry if it seems like I'm belaboring the point, but this really is the point of a preamp. I'll make one more drawing to show why that buffer stage is so important. Here's the signal. Here's the preamp's output impedance, and here's the power amp's input impedance. The signal that the power amp gets depends on the values of those resistors on the top and bottom. If the power amp impedance is 100k, then 100k goes on the bottom, here. With the buffer, 100 ohms output impedance goes on top, here and the signal seen by the power amp is reduced by the fraction 100,000 over 100,100, which is 99.9%, .9%, and that's awesome. Without the buffer, and say the volume pod is set to 50%, then approximately 25k goes on top, and the signal is reduced by the fraction 100,000 over 125,000, or 80% of the signal input. That's not horrible, but what if the power amp input impedance is only 10k? With the buffer, 10,000 over 10,100 is still 99%. But without the buffer, 10,000 over 35,000 is 29%. And now our volume control is wreaking havoc and not behaving like the controller we want. All of this is simply to point out that the preamp does a whole lot more than maybe provide some gain ahead of the power amp. The most important function of the preamp is to provide a low output impedance signal at a level controlled by the user. And most preamps worthy of that general designation provide other controls as well. Through the preamp, which may be labeled by its maker as a control amplifier, the user controls which among different sources gets fed to the power amp and hence the speakers through the source selector. Aspects of the tone or frequency response through the tone controls and or loudness control and the relative attenuation of one or the other channel through the balance control. A few standalone preamps and many that are built into receivers and integrated amps even allow the user to select from among two or more sets of speakers. I did kind of gloss over the actual amplification provided by many preamps. But amplification with equalization is necessary if we want to listen to records, aka vinyls. Yuck. Many modern preamps don't have phono stages and require vinyl enthusiasts to use either a standalone phono stage or a turntable with a built-in phono preamp. My ideal preamp would not only include a phono preamp, but also accommodate a variety of phono cartridges, whether moving magnet, moving coil, moving iron, or other, with a variety of requirements for input impedance, input capacitance, and gain. Phono preamps and accommodation of the currently available variety of cartridges could easily fill their own video. So I'll move on. To summarize our progress so far, I'm talking about preamps that may also be known as control amplifiers and may include phono preamplification and equalization stages. From here on, I'll focus on two controls that preamps that are also control amps should do, volume and source selection. Those of you who haven't gone down either of these rabbit holes might be wondering what there is to talk about. Volume control and source selection are simple and basic, aren't they? I thought so before I encountered Morgan Jones. I'll start with the common, cheap implementations of these functions before addressing the shortcomings of those implementations and the better, more expensive ways to implement these functions. First, volume control. 
I've already shown you how a volume control changes volume by changing the partitioning of resistance between the top and bottom of the voltage divider by moving the tap or wiper. The traditional implementation is to use a potentiometer. Signal in at the top to a terminal connected to one end of some carbon composite material or nowadays plastic and the other end connected to ground. The center terminal is connected to a wiper that glides along the top of the carbon composite wafer. Potentiometers like this are fine, but not ideal. The metal wiper can oxidize or crud can get inside and interfere with the electrical connection between the wiper and the wafer. The carbon composite can also become worn, and that'll make the pot behave differently as it ages. And remember that for stereo, there will be two pots. Pots like this aren't super precise in the first place, and they just get worse and more different from each other as they get older. The more precise and durable method for controlling volume is with a stepped attenuator. You start with a rotary switch with a bunch of positions and connect precision resistors all the way around. I've got an example here. The volume control will employ this ridiculous looking rotary switch, and there will be discrete precise resistors connecting all these tabs. Relative to old-fashioned pots, stepped attenuators are expensive. The rotary switches are expensive, and choosing and mounting the resistors requires significant time and labor. But source selectors are simple, right? You've got a bunch of sources connected to terminals that you turn the knob to switch among. And that'll work, but again, it's not ideal. First, the terminals can oxidize and make progressively worse electrical connections over time. Second, when one source is selected, adjacent terminals can still have live signals that can, in turn, induce signals in the active channel. No one wants to hear a faint radio signal during a quiet passage on a CD or record or whatever. What's better is to shunt unselected sources to ground. The best implementation, then, is to use the selector switch to control mercury-wetted relays that switch the signal to either ground or the input to the preamp circuitry. Yeah, sounds expensive. And these are just two things that make the best preamps expensive. Preamps have more than volume controls and source selectors, but I think I've covered enough to tell you why you need a preamp and why the best preamps are so expensive. Geez, I haven't even touched on modern conveniences like remote controls. Oh well, another time. I hope you enjoyed the video, or at least learned something useful. Please do the things that tickle the algorithm. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, share the video, and leave a comment. As my summer break approaches, it's likely that my rate of video production will slacken in favor of spending time actually building, fixing, and restoring. That said, I do respond to incentives and encouragement. It's just been a while since I've had a video get more than a few thousand views. I'm not complaining, but building, fixing, and restoring bring in more cash. Just saying. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon.